I'm Pastor Duncan. Welcome to Change the World Church. It's May 29, 2022. Let's pray. All right, Father God, you're King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You want, you wish that no wicked would perish. You want all to live, all to turn from their wicked ways and live. You wish none to perish, Lord. You wish, you take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And you wish that they would turn from their wicked ways and live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, title of today's sermon. It's a lengthy one. You can turn to Ezekiel 33 in your Bible. We encourage you to have a real Bible where you can actually physically take notes, a study Bible where you can actually... Um, make references and dates and um, physically connect the dots between scripture and verses as the spirit leads and brings those things together if you're in tune with the spirit. Also, in terms of dedication to the Lord and service to Christ, we're going to talk about uh, what it means to walk with God, um, to, to walk in the ways of the Lord. And part of that is to... Um, to give your treasure and to dedicate heart and treasure go together. So where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. If your heart's in the Lord, then that's where you're going to dedicate. So um, we're all in for Christ. Pray about it as the uh, Lord leads. Um, you can go to the bottom of each page of our website, changetheworldchurch.com. Uh, you're there now. I'm sure if this is the same website when you're listening to this or whatever resource um, you found this on, changetheworldchurch.com, all one word. And at the bottom of each uh, webpage uh, is a place where you can give and type to the Lord. We're all in, and um, well, our hearts, your hearts, all hearts should be surrendered to Christ. And we are surrendered to the Lord fully. Okay, title of today's sermon, Ezekiel 33. Say to them, as I live, all caps, exclamation point as I live or all caps exclamation point say to them comma as I live declares the, the Lord God the Lord God is all caps say to them as I live declares the Lord God the Lord God is all caps comma I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Does God take pleasure in the death of the wicked? No. So that's one of the big questions, right? One of the big questions we answered last week was, um, did God create Satan evil? Did no. 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 He was perfect. He created him perfect. All creation. He chose to sin. Or anyone who chooses to sin and continue and persevere in that sin. God punishes. If you turn from God, he created him perfect. His intent was and desire was that everyone should follow him and worship him. So the next question is, does he create just um, sovereignly, or does he create anyone for that he desires to just be wicked and commit to hell?
No. He takes no desire. No pleasure in the wicked. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But rather that the wicked turn away from his way and live. Live is capital L. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways! Exclamation point. Why then will you die? And dot, 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 question mark. So say to them, comma, as I live, all caps, exclamation point, declares the Lord God, the Lord God, all caps. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, comma, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live, capital L. Turn back, comma, turn back from your evil ways, exclamation point. Why then will you die? Dot, 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 question mark. So you can find that in verse 10. That's straight from scripture. Verse 11. So straight scripture from verse 11. That's just straight scripture. The rest of the title is found in Ezekiel 33, 1 through 6, and goes like this. And the word of the Lord came to me. The word is capitalized, obviously. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take one man from among them and make them their watchman, and he sees, so this is the man of the Lord, right? A man of God. Any, a man of God. And he hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning. And a sword comes and takes him away. His blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. So if the man, wicked man, hears the warning from the trumpet and does not heed it, the blood's on his own head. The watchman sounded the trumpet. He gave the warning. He was appointed. He saw it. He sounded the warning. Those who heard the warning and do not turn, the blood's on their own head. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. If he had taken the warning, he would have delivered his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, right? But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. So if you sound the trumpet, you're surrendered to Christ, you're appointed, you're watching over. Are anyone surrendered to Christ in tune with the Holy Spirit? And you see which then in the spirit you can see Christ. You understand the gospel. You understand your commissioning because you received Christ. The veil's been taken off, 1 Corinthians 2. It's taken off your eyes. You can see. And you sound the trumpet. Report the gospel. Give the good news. Your and the person in iniquity doesn't heed the warning, but continues in his wicked ways. He'll lose his life. He'll be taken. 
and his blood will be on his own hands, his own head. But if he hears the warning, you sounded the warning, you're in Christ, you see the Holy Spirit, you see the scripture, you share the gospel, and you sound the trumpet. And he hears and turns from his wicked ways and follows Christ. He will have delivered his life. But if you don't sound the trumpet, you receive Christ, you understand scripture, you understand your commissioning in the Lord to share the gospel, and you don't share the gospel, that wicked person will be taken away in their iniquity, and his blood will be on your head. You're required to sound the trumpet. And if they hear the trumpet and turn from their wicked ways, they can live. If they don't and continue in their iniquity, they'll die in their iniquity. Okay, so let's start with Ezekiel 33, verse 1, and read through it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, he sees, the watchman sees the sword coming upon the land. You're a watchman, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the gospel. You understand the gospel of the Lord. You're in tune with the Spirit because you're surrendered, you're following Christ, you're following His way. Sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people. So you share the gospel. You know that life, Christ is life. You can see it. You understand it. You're in Christ. You can see it. And you blow the trumpet, meaning you share the gospel and explain to people to, to live as Christ. You blow the trumpet and warn the people. And he who hears the sound of the trumpet hears the gospel. And that person does not take the warning. A sword comes and takes him away and his blood will be on his own head. He doesn't have life on earth. He's it's just a walking dry bones corpse he's a walking corpse he doesn't have life on earth and when that dry bones or corpse that has a fleshly beating heart dies or expires they have human death they forever have death in hell and, and torment and suffering their their they their soul the worm that's their soul always exists forever in torment and hell and punishment
punishment and anguish and thirst and burning and pain forever. Forever, sulfur, pain, just the, the worst punishment and anguish you can imagine eternally because they didn't heed the warning. They were a sinner. They continued, they chose the way of iniquity and sin. God gave them this beautiful soul and body from nothing. He granted them a body and a soul and a life from nothing. God gave that to them with a perfect plan to serve and be filled with him and commune with him and by the creator who made you. And instead, they decided to dishonor God and chose sin. And the result of that, it's walking dead man on earth and then punishment and death forever, torment forever. But he, you blow the trumpet, and that person takes the warning, he will have delivered his life. So now you're talking about eternal life and peace and purpose, life now on earth, fullness, and eternal life in heaven forever serving the God who created you. And he wants that. He takes no pleasure in the wicked. He wants everyone to have life in him. He created you to have life in him. He created you perfectly to have life in him. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, so you know the gospel and you know Christ, you have life in Christ and does not blow the trumpet. You don't share the gospel. You don't warn uh, the people. The people are not warned and a sword comes and takes the person from them. That person's fleshly corpse, the sinner dies and you didn't blow the trumpet. He is taken away in his iniquity. He's going to die in his iniquity because he chose to sin. But his blood will be required of the watchman's hands. His blood will be required of the believer who had a chance to blow the trumpet and share the gospel. The blood is required on his head. That's how serious this is. Say so you have an FCA meeting, ball game, and you're playing on the lacrosse field. And all the seniors or high schoolers are gathered. And it's an FCA sponsored event. And they may go to that one game before they get hurt, or they may only be at that one game, or something may happen to them, or a person they know. And you and you don't gather them and pray with them and share the gospel. And something happens to them and they die in their iniquity. You didn't blow the trumpet. at that Learn to Skate event. You didn't share the gospel when you had the chance. They don't come back, or the person that their mother dies, or their grandmother dies that week, and they don't hear the gospel. The blood's on you. You sense it to the Spirit. The Spirit gives you an opportunity to share, and you share in the Spirit, and that blood's on you on your head. And that's the point you were put on earth. I got a text late last night from a friend of ours and the father was in the hospital. Kidneys failing, heart racing, death door in another state. I don't know from anything, but that was the closest thing this friend had to a last chance pastor who understood how to share the gospel. He said, please call now, emergently, and share the gospel, and I did. And if they receive it, they get the message, and I had to leave a, I had to leave a voicemail but I let the the son his son know who's my friend that I had 
left the message. I left a complete message like the Lord said on how to be praying and how to receive the gospel and walk through the relevant scriptures on how to do that. And if he receives Christ, he'll live. If he, if he didn't, or if he's in iniquity, and he continue, and he was in iniquity, and continues, and doesn't heed the warning, the blood's on him. But not on, not on me. I shared, I shared the gospel. I sounded the trumpet. Don't don't miss an opportunity. God gives you, you just lay it out. Don't miss an opportunity. Share the gospel. And sometimes it's the Lord says, quiet. You know, it's it's but you have to be submitted, surrendered, and completely in tune of the spirit in every opportunity. You can, even if it's giving them a pen, a direction onto the website, our business card with the website, the head of the gospel, or just sharing the scripture. Hebrews four twelve, where the Lord penetrates mind, body, and soul. It's the only thing that penetrates the soul, divides marrow and soul, everything. That scripture will penetrate. How do you do it? You give them the scripture. The scripture penetrates. Humans, a human can't go in and find a soul. I've been throughout the whole body. I've dissected it all. I've been in all different surgeries and rotations. In trauma, I held a man's heart in my hand, plugging the hole after a bullet shot and literally did resuscitation physically with my hand, made an incision, opened up the ribs, went in, plugged the hole, and was keeping the man alive. The heart, the mind, the brain, the neurosurgery, the seat of the consciousness, where is that? But the soul, man and human beings can't penetrate. Only God can do that, and, all, and God is the Word of God, which is Christ, which is Scripture, in John 1 and 1 John, and throughout the whole Holy Bible. You sound the trumpet, you give the Scripture. Don't miss that chance. Now, as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. You, if you're surrendered to Christ, and you're a disciple in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Of course, you want to go and go on to be baptized by in the water, like Christ submerged, baptizo. You're brought up out of that water. You've already received Christ and been saved, but you follow on. You're a disciple. You're pouring into the Bible. You're reading it. Uh, sins that you're doing, you you chunk, you get rid of everything. You clean the whole proverbial closet out of your house, which is your mental, physical house. You clean all the circuits of the grease off the engines and the keyboards and computer. You get rid of all the junk. You destroy the old hard drive. Get rid of it. Magnetize and cry. How do you do that? By immersing in scripture and doing everything. You don't look at other women. Uh, anything you've stolen or taken, if you're a guy. If you're a... Um, same thing, reverse for the woman. If you have taken anything or charged usury or stolen, you pay it back. Pay it back with interest. You know, you pay it back and then some. And you don't, you no longer participate in anything shady or sinful. You get rid of it and you make it right. You just, you get rid of it and you make it right. And then you pursue Christ. Like Nicodemus. Fully. Yeah, perfect. Fully. Exactly. That, that is how you live on earth. And then you have fullness in Christ and clean conscience and spirit. And that's how you live. And then you have eternal life, which life on earth is a vapor, James. 
just to show this. I have appointed you a watchman. You in the Holy Spirit, if you've received Christ and you're following the Lord, have been appointed a watchman. Meaning a person ready to share the gospel for the house of Israel. Now, Ezekiel literally is prophet. And that he's literally a prophet here to share the gospel in such a way that he could see the Lord and share with them in a way um, that they couldn't see. And literally, at the end of it, when it all happens according to what the Lord showed him in the Holy Spirit, they're going to look back and say, this is truly a prophet. This is truly the words of God. And they're going to see it. They, we can see it because he said it and it all happened. We can see crystal clear because we're in the Spirit and the Spirit is Christ and 1 Corinthians 2 shows us that. Who's got 1 Corinthians 2? So when you have the Holy Spirit, the veil comes off your eyes and you can truly see. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the spirit of that person who is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him but we have the mind of Christ amen so you can only see if you have Christ the natural man doesn't understand you're not to be judged except by God or Christ it's only people that have spiritual discernment have that wisdom and ability to make those determinations if only then if from the spirit and if authorized to do so Now, as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel, so you will hear a message from my mouth. Now, he, let's look at it, and you understand the viewpoint of being a Christian and a disciple and your responsibility to share the gospel. Um, now, let's go into it specifically from Ezekiel's standpoint, as appointed as a watchman for Israel, okay? And look at it that while keeping the other in mind and your responsibility, okay? I have appointed you, Ezekiel, a watchman for the house of Israel, so you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. As you think about Israel, I want you to also apply this to your own lives and sharing with other people as we think about what he was charged to do at the time, okay? So keep both in your mind parallel. When I say to the wicked, when God says to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you will surely die, and you... When you see you, I want you to apply yourself also. 
Ezekiel's being talked to, but I want God is talking to you through the scripture as a believer, as a disciple, a true disciple believer, sure unto Christ. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his wicked way, he will die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your life. Now why would that man die? Because of his iniquity. Because of his iniquity. If you are in iniquity, you'll die. What happens if you repent and turn to Christ and follow him? Mm-hmm. Everyone? Everyone? If you repent and turn, yes. Everyone? Yes. She's not in. Excellent. Now, as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have spoken, saying, Surely, so, what if you're so rotten, and so just rotten in your your flesh, your corpsely, earthly flesh is so rotten in sin that you're just rotting away. And God has held back the floodgates of his wrath out of just pure compassion and mercy as long as he could and then for his to demonstrate his power and glory pours it out to maximize saving who will be saved and to show his power and glory i mean he's just been offended rotting rotting sinful flesh just flaunted in his face and he's held back his due respect the due respect of the Lord and the Creator. Have you ever been disrespected? Picture a time you were just extremely disrespected and you were doing the right thing and you were disrespected as a righteous person. Think about how much injustice that engendered in your heart and mind as your Holy Spirit inside you with the Lord just burned with injustice. Of course, you, you know, the Lord says, turn it over to the Lord, right? And you turn it over to the Lord. And the Lord is the Lord. Um, think about how the Lord feels with all that just wicked, flooding, fl- uh, rotting fleshly injustice poured upon him. And he, he's holding back and he, he has not only, he is, you know, his doxa, which is his glory and just majesty, needs to shine, right? How do you, they're asking, how do you get saved from that, being just a piece of rotting, carrying flesh of a person? I mean, you're alive, but from a sinful standpoint, just a rotting, stinky flesh pot of carcass of just rotting flesh, but but alive. That's I'm talking about sinful in your sin. Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us. Why are they seeing that? What year are we in? After total destruction. Five eighty six. On five eighty six, almost five eighty five, right? So yeah, total destruction. So they're set, they've just seen complete destruction. Walls, God's spirit left the temple three years prior to that and just the whole thing is leveled. I mean, just burned, torched. The most vilest, violent people ever with no barriers at all have gone in and done everything. Add pestilence, add wild animals, uh, add, you know, uh, everything, um, weather destruction, every other kind of destruction God has delivered because of their sins. We've, we've been through that extensively, right? So they're seeing, they're understanding, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us. 
and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? What do they do right in that sentence? They're asking, how can we survive? What's the first step to resuscitation and recovery in life? Wanting to resuscitate. Yeah. Understanding you're a sinner and wanting to resuscitate. We're rotting in our sins. How can we survive? The first step in gaining life is to understand you're a sinner. Admit you're a sinner, recognize you're a sinner, and ask God, how do we survive? A person's dying, rotting in their flesh, bacteria eating away, just rotten, and you come up to them as a physician and a healer, or a, a nurse, or anybody offering help. Health. What's the first thing if that person is to receive and restore their health, resuscitate their health. They have to recognize they have a problem and receive, ask how they can be helped. If they say, no, I want to continue to rot away, they're going to die in that rotten, sinful nature. Or if you don't offer help, they're going to die and it's going to be on you for not offering the help. To give them the salvation. We are rotting away in our sins. How then? Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us. We are rotting away in them. How can we survive? You say to them, as I live, exclamation, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn away from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Again, say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, verse 11, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die? And specifically here, O house of Israel, in this context, but translated today. And you, son of man, say to your fellow citizens, the righteousness of a righteous man will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. You've received Christ. You're walking in righteousness. You've been told by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, and your spirit-filled brethren that you're righteous. How does he get saved? You then turn into iniquity. Will that righteousness save you? If you now turn to iniquity, no. you're going to die in that iniquity. And he's not going to remember your righteousness. What if you're a, just a rotting sinner and you turn and walk in the way, like we said, the righteous way? Is he going to remember your iniquity or is he going to restore you? He'll give you a new. He'll restore you. It's spiritually restored, which then starts to reflect in your life. I take no pleasure, the Lord says, in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say to your fellow citizens, the righteousness of a righteous man will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he will not stumble because of it in the day when he turns from his wickedness. So if he turns from his wickedness 
and goes for righteousness in the day of judgment, he will not stumble because of his own wickedness. He'll be restored. Whereas a righteous man will not be able to live by his righteousness on the day when he commits sin. So if you are a righteous man and you're declared righteous and you're like, I've been saved and righteous. And you turn into the path of wickedness, that righteousness will not save you. You'll be in sin now, turning away from God and choosing a life of sin. Whereas a righteous man will not be able to live by his righteousness on the day when he commits sin. When I say to the righteous, he will surely live, will you surely live? It's a question. When I say to the righteous, you will surely live. So he's already declared the righteous person righteous and that he will live. He's declared that. That person has been declared righteous and has life. Any, I mean, is there any question to that or opposition to that? So he said to this righteous man, he will surely live, verse 13. And so he so trusts in his righteousness, okay? So he's been declared righteous, and so now he's having faith in Christ or having faith in the fact he's been declared righteous. Now, he was declared righteous. He's trusting in God and following God, or he's trusting in the fact that he's been declared righteous in this verse. He's trusting in the fact that he's been declared righteous. He's trusting in this verse by the fact he's been declared righteous. So he's trusting in the fact he's been declared righteous. He's, he's told he's been saved or he's declared righteous. And he commits iniquity. None of his righteous deeds will be remembered. But in that same iniquity of his which he has committed, he will die. You've been declared saved. You've been declared righteous. Now you're trusting in that righteousness, but you're walking in iniquity. He will not remember your righteousness and you will die in your iniquity. But if a wicked man which he has committed, he will die. But when I say to the wicked, you will surely die. So he's been declared wicked, he's been sentenced to death. He's still humanly alive, but his flesh and soul and corpse is, he's a walking corpse. He's dead in his writing sins, right? But he turns from his sin and practices justice and righteousness. So what's an act of repentance look like in, in Christ inside you look like? Turning away from your sin. Yeah. yeah. And pursuing Christ and just having a repentant heart and having the right heart. You have a repentant heart and a right heart. And what does that lead to? You get rid of your sin and pursue Christ. Okay, you get rid of your sin and pursue Christ. What does that look like? Living clean. Um, what's that look like? I mean, your life looks completely different. Yeah. You know, I mean, you see a visible change. You knew that person before, yeah. and now you're like, is that the same person? Yeah. Kind of like Saul and Paul. Yeah, you physically see a difference in their life. They're serving God. They're sharing. They're serving the poor. They're paying back their debts. They're treating people kindly. They're acting with justice. They're being kind to animals. They're taking care of the world in the way that God intended, and taking care of people, nice, just, you're about to say, same, yeah. So that, that there's, a, there's a visible, everything in life that you that is in the Bible, you're physically doing. Like you see it reflected in your actions. Like, you know, people verbalize things. It's verbalizing something versus actually physically walking it. James, rubber meets the road. You're actually looking and physically walking your faith. 
And then if you see that, you, your life, you're walking by the step. He is, if a wicked man restores a pledge, what does that mean? Like a pledge is like uh, collateral. Yeah. Gives back the collateral and pays back what he's taken by robbery. Now robbery can mean just exacting high interest from people, can, you know, leveraging them, you know, manipulating, getting in the power of strength. And, you know, you can, you can take things from people utilizing a not God perfectly based legal system, loopholes, they call them, things that get around that allow you to sin against God. And you can leverage and do things against people and take things from people. And they say, oh, he's just being strong. Well, that's sin. And that, those things you have to restore back to righteousness. You have to restore those things. You, you have to have a tender heart and the mercies of the weak. And um, people, you have to restore their property and their items back to people. And allow people to do things in justice. And taken by all that stuff is included in the robbery. And robbery itself. <laughs> Thievery. Walks and you walk by the statutes of the Lord, which ensure life without committing iniquity. So you walk by the statutes and you don't, you're not committing iniquity. You're not a fence surfing bench warmer. If you're a fence surfing bench warmer, where one day you're doing one thing, one day you're on the other, you're warming the bench, you're you're mouthing one thing about God, but Dipping into sin, back, those people, God, will vomit you out of your mouth. Revelations chapters 2 and 3, 3 specifically. We'll double check that. Revelation 2 and 3, the churches. God will spit you out of his mouth, vomit you out of his mouth. Yes, chapter 3, Sardis. Yeah. God will vomit you out of his mouth. None of his sins. So he's, he's walking in the statutes. He's ensuring life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins that he's committed will be remembered against him. He has practiced justice and righteousness. He shall surely live. Confirmed. Yet your fellow citizens say the way of the Lord is not right. So what do you do when you want to live your way and make up your own righteous regime? What would you do in your sinful heart against the Lord? You try to change the rules. So your only option to change the rules is to literally say God creator himself is not right as a man, as a piece of clay that's been produced and made by God and molded by God. You have to really, you have to, you have to refute God, it's the only, which is impossible. So they're saying those pieces of clay humans made by God are saying the way of the Lord is not right. It's their own way. Those people who claim that their righteousness will save them, the, the fact that they've been righteous, they were saved at one point, they claim that the, their way is right and they'll live by their own intuition, by their own making outside of God, which is incredibly poor, just completely sinful and wrong. When it is their way that is not right. It's their way that's not right. When the righteousness turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, so the righteous man, he says it again, in case you didn't get it the first three or four times. But God says it again. When the righteous turns from his righteousness, is he walking in righteousness? How do you walk in righteousness? By not turning from your righteousness. Can a human being, a sinful human being, um, just kind of make up righteousness. There's only one way to be righteous, right? You have to surrender yourself, receive Christ, or the statutes of God with a future Messiah. You know, trust in Messiah coming through David. You know, Christ is coming. The Holy Spirit is around. You have to receive God and his statutes and his ordinances and follow today, follow Christ. Then follow God. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbors yourself. And receive his spirit of God. Follow God and his commandments and live righteously in the Lord. I mean, those two incorporate the Bible. 
yes, Messiah is coming, he'll save, he'll restore. Or Messiah has come in this case. For us, Messiah has come and, and sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice, rebuilt the temple, which is himself. Um, repent of your sins, receive Christ, the blood of Christ washes you, Romans 3, 23 through 25. Religious sin or death, but the gift of God is eternal life, Romans 6, 23. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the whole world, all the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, everyone, whosoever should believe in him, if they believe in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. That belief in him, restoration, these are righteous people that have believed. They're following God, they're following God's statutes. When that righteous person turns from his righteousness, following God, that's like the what? The pig going back to the mud or the dog returning to his vomit, right? You know the scripture. You want to look those up. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and practices justice and righteousness, he, oh sorry, when the righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall what? Die. He shall die in it. If you turn from that righteousness and commit iniquity, you will die. Meaning eternal death, hell, damnation we talked about. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and practices justice and righteousness, he will what? He will live in them. Yet you say, they're trying to say the Lord's not right, O house of Israel. God's saying, I will judge each of you. And he's saying to each of us according to your ways. Every one of us. Okay, who's got Romans 9? Let's start with 22 through 23, and then we'll go to 17 through 18. Okay, Romans 9. So in summary, when God blows the trumpet... That's the gospel. You sound the trumpet. Oh, so when you see the enemy, which we see, you sound the trumpet. You share the gospel. And then you're responsible for that. And then what, what the man does, if he comes to Christ, he's, he lives. And if he doesn't, the blood's on him, but not on you. Romans 9, 22 through 23. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? All right, let's look at that. Day. Um, also continued it moreover he conditionally so a condition so conditionally Theos is God Lord God Almighty exceedingly good God exceedingly God like exceedingly the God of God King of Kings Theo Othello So, impulse, meaning to go forward. So his will is now being projected forward. Like, taking into account everything. And Deacon knew me, shows so his now his will, which is collective will, he's going to allow you to see it. He's going to show it forth. For gay is a violent passion, abhorrence, anger, indignation, a vengeant wrath. Just a vengeant, angry wrath that's been stored and being poured forward and shown. By his will. Kai and, right? You know that one. You know this one. 
Nerizo. It's a form of Kenosko, similar to declare, make known, understand. So, so that declaring and making known, you can comprehend it. It's a will pouring forth, shown, just wrath, such in the way that you're able to see it and comprehend it. Ados, his own, referring to his own. Denotos, and it is a mighty possible, it is a strong power. So he's pouring forth his wrath and allowing you to comprehend and understand his power. Narita, no. So his wrath is made known and comprehended, his power is made known and comprehended. Pharaoh. So, rushing forth, like, just, it's been endured and now it's pouring forth. Something that's been endured and rushing forth. In, for the sake of, mightily, quickly, shortly. Polos, polos. Doubled. Just abundantly. Just spent. So something that's just abundant and spent. It's been, it's being spent. Like it's, it's abundantly poured forth and being spent, like paid out. Macrothumia in long suffering patience and fortitude. Wrath and power being poured out after long standing fortitude and patience. Just enduring, long standing, enduring sinful nature and just disrespect. He's been enduring disrespect for a, just a long time. And now he's paying that and spending that wrath and power to make it known. Spending that as a, as a result. It's a key use. Equipment or vessels like a wife so a vessel god created to be useful for him it's a vessel god made supposed to be used supposed to be used for god but is being used for sin instead of being at the banquet table of christ as a vessel he created and molded in him and restored in him. It's some crack vessel being used out in the wasteland on its own program being used for sinful purposes. Cartizo. So it was prepared to be restored. Supposed to be, it's adjusted and fit and framed. So that vessel is being is fit and framed according to its actions because it's fit and framed in the sinful nature he forbore he was forbearing it long suffering that vessel that's being this fit and framed in the sins that it's been doing rather than allowing him in the perfect way he intended it for it to be made to be utilized because of its actions of righteousness for God. So as a result of it fitting it and preparing it, it's been preparing for a long time in the sinful nature, continuing the sinful nature, and God is finally long-sufferingly pouring out his wrath on it. He is for more, far more exceedingly now 
uh, toward to Paris, expressing the emotion of that. Apuleia, in reflection of their pernicious ways and damnable ways and destruction. So they're a reflection, fitting, been fit together in their damnable ways for destruction and being poured out his power destruction on and anger into this. To They've been fitting together for damnation, pours out the wrath and gives them the damnation that they've worked toward in their sinful nature. And Kai, Hina, in order that for the purpose, why would he do that? They've been sitting in damnation, they're constructive, they went that way, he then long sufferingly pours it out so that, okay, so putting it together from the beginning of verse 23, Kai and Hina. The intent, an order, purpose, that, for the intent that Norizo, again, for the intent that, that it be made known, you know, knowledge, known, cognizance, cognitive, Norizo, known, Norizo, Plutos, is literally the abundance or richness. So when you think of God, God is all good. So just in the abundant, so that you may in the abundant richness know. So his wrath is poured out on these vessels that have continued to sin and continue in that sinful way and have knitted themselves together in that, in that way and he's held back with patience, his wrath, and then poured it out just like, just like we saw in Ezekiel. Just, not go, just like we saw in Egypt. The Egyptians just continued to sin, continued to sin, continued to sin, thinks he's a God, continued to ignore God. He held back with patience and then, and then gave them, you know, look, I just attacked the Nile, which is like your God, your ultimate God. And, and turn it to blood. So, and then follows plague after plague after plague. Giving them, a, just in their mercy, for, in, and for 400 years, they've been enslaved the Egyptians, you know, the Israelites. It is, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. And just like they held back their wrath for hundreds of years on the Israelites, and then Israel was given over to the Assyrians, and then Judah, Jerusalem, destroy just continue sinning holding back they they form their vessel and that vessel that's been formed in that god then pours back his right so that you can see in the abundance the abundance rich valuable bestowment abundance riches and abundant just abundant riches autos of his god's own doxa just literal glory, dignity, honor, praise, just the most glorious honor, praise you can think of, honoring richness of honoring God. So you could dishonor the full richness of the glory and majesty and worship and praise bestowed, needing to be bestowed on God. Just his full majesty and his glory and the honor and wealth that goes to God. To understand that level of majesty and honor and worthiness. Epi in direction toward Skios, vessels that were created in such a way like like a wife to a husband or a ship would be to your use or a, a vessel um, that you would carry for, for good God's made you to for a purpose to carry goods you know and you, you bring those goods 
or a wife is to a husband, you are for God, you know, you're created for that purpose. Helios, which is the divine compassion God's given you as a result of your striving for righteousness and Him showing mercy on you. Now, who should get mercy? Who does God want to have mercy? Get mercy? Everyone. Everyone. Just the Jews? Jews and Gentiles. Everyone. Does he take pleasure in the destruction of any wicked? No. Protolemezo, in advance, literally prepared beforehand that this time with this purpose for his glory. And it goes on to talk about should Gentiles receive God and be able to be in tune with God. He's saying, yes, at this time for his glory, I poured forth my wrath on those not worthy and I'm having mercy on everyone, not just the Jewish people, but Gentiles as well. Everyone who receives Christ gets mercy. He prepared everyone at this time period when Christ came to be able to have and receive Christ. Everyone before could follow God. Anyone could go and follow God. We ran into all kinds of people in the Bible that decided to go for God. And what's a king that was utilized by God, appointed by him? In this time period, Cyrus. Good. Yeah. Okay, let's read 17 and 18. Romans 9, 17, 13. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he, whomever he wills. So you recount the story of the plagues. Who chose to ignore God? For the first five, like five, first half, basically. Yeah. Pharaoh. And then we can look at a plague um, halfway through, then God decided he was going to show his power. He continually, he was basically what, a live or dead man, Pharaoh, because of his continued sin. Just dead, dead corpse, walking corpse. Now, did God let him die physically, or did he keep him alive? Why did he keep him alive, knowing he was going to continue to sin, and God just allowed him to live, even though he was basically on death's door because of all the plagues and everything else. He allowed him to live, but then hardened his heart at that point, used him as a vessel just to what? Show his glory and power. So the key word here is. I'll lead up to it. I'll start just from the beginning. Gar 4, Graphe, scripture, right? Graphe, written word of God. Written. Lego. Speech. Written speech. So the written word of God, right? Are the word of God. Pharaoh. Expressed to Pharaoh the written word of God regarding Pharaoh abundantly concerning, more exceedingly concerning this. Hoti, concerning this, abundantly concerning this topic. Tutu, the same, and abundantly concerning the same, Pharaoh. The word of God. Express word of God abundantly concerning Pharaoh. This topic. Himself. He himself 
concerning the subject of topic of Pharaoh. Exegera literally released his affliction and resuscitated him from death. He literally kept him from just going into the grave and kept him around. Released him from death. Resuscitate. So literally resuscitated or released him from dying and death for a little bit longer. And um, even then, um, when he was at the Red Sea, what happened to his chariot as he charged? you think about that so the point is you guys remember was it he was the only one that didn't was it are you sure all right we'll come back to that okay. i'll let you think about it after the break so even then, restored and resuscitated him as a testimony to God's power as he poured out his entire wrath on his people, his army, and everything. Just poured out on him. Yet, yeah, didn't die in the plagues. All right, Lord, your King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if we choose to follow you and continue to persevere, will live if we turn away from you if we don't choose the righteous way or don't continue in the righteous way and turn to sin we will die in that sin if we repent of that iniquity and turn towards you and follow you in righteousness we'll live amen First Thessalonians five. Yes. <clears throat> Verse nine. Mm-hmm. For God is not get des- scoop on you guys. <laughs> for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, can you read it again? <clears throat> for God has not destined us destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God has not predestined or committed us to death, but what does he want? He doesn't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants everyone to be saved. Yeah, he wants us to, and what does the verse say? For obtaining salvation. Through Christ. He's destined us to obtain salvation. He's destined us to obtain salvation through Christ, just like he said. He doesn't take any pleasure in death. Perfect. So if you continue in sin, he may not have you die immediately, but you're continuing in sin, he may use you as an object to show his incredible power and glory and all that wrath stored up for that sinful life and nature and rotting flesh and corpse. He pours that wrath out and shows his glory and power. He's to be honored. He's a holy God. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the glorious creator who created everything in his spirit and life and purpose. And he is worthy to be praised and honored above everything. And that power and wrath he makes known so we can comprehend it is a reflection of his worthiness to be worshipped. And for those who live to glory in him and, and live here and have eternal life. And we pray every person will turn from their wicked way and follow righteousness otherwise you die in that wickedness at whatever point you decide to turn into wickedness and persist you will die in that wickedness you'll blot your name out from the book of life it says in revelation 3 you know rather than turn and walk if you turn from your sin and walk in christ he'll forget your sin and he'll live 
now and in judgment day and forever. And forever being tormented just like who's going to be thrown into hell? Satan and death and Hades. Yeah. And all those who follow him and everyone who commits sin and continues in sin, death and Hades too, all are going to be committed to hell forever, tormented forever. Created perfect and chose to sin and pride. Now in the twelfth year of our exile, what year would that be? Good. Before or after? So five eighty five comes before five eighty six. After. Uh, okay. Because it's BC. All right. Good. <laughs> Counting backwards. The refugees from Jerusalem came to me saying. The city has been taken. Does that make sense in the timeline? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Refugees came a year quickly, within very early in the year, upon destruction. So where would they walk me through it? Total destruction, sword, pestilence, famine. Where, where, are, some, where are some options or places these people might have scrambled to, unless they were escorted directly by the Babylonians? Let's say even if they weren't escorted directly, where might they have gone? Let's say a few escaped here and there. Like maybe they weren't in the city, maybe they were in the out and about, maybe they were in the city, but somehow they got out the back door or something. Or they could have gone to Jericho. Or maybe they were sorry, maybe they're just too much to, you know, handle and they just released them. Maybe they were escorted back. Okay, where could they yeah, Jericho? They could have gone east to Jericho and then crossed the Jericho. Oh I'm sorry, before the uh, before that. Before the escape route, I like the way you're thinking. Yes, there's two routes they could have gone back to Babylon, but I'm talking about immediately before they started the journey. Where's three places you could survive temporarily? Uh, Lakish. Okay, give give me a broader give me a broader category. Good answer. What would Lakish fall under? Like a fortified city. Yeah. So fortified city or cave, you could go there. Where else could you go? You could go to like the wilderness. Yeah, just the wilderness, like an open field. What else could you go? You well, could cross well, the Jordan and go into Edom and Ammon. Where would we can? Yeah, and that. Where would be, yeah, so where would be a place the enemy would have a hard time getting into? Egypt. Uh, no, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about broad, 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 big brush here. Not specifics. Maybe. Types of ter terrain or territory areas, that kind of stuff. You're trying to escape, you're trying to run. You should get on a boat and sail. Mountains. Yeah, mountain fortified city caves mountains. We we'll cover that kind of. But good answer. Good answer. How about where would you go from here? Let's assume you don't use the sea. What are some options? You said mountains, strongholds, caves, fortified city. Okay. You said open field. Where else could you go? Where would, where would you want to go to survive right now from here? Where would you go? I mean, somewhere near water <laughs> and shelter. So um, you probably don't think like this because you haven't been on the run. Um, but some place would be hard to track would be like a wasteland. Dismal Swamp would be the closest wasteland I could think of from here. Or like a waste area at the bottom of the city that's got garbage and dumps. Or uh, quicksand. I think Edom might be qualified as a wasteland once you get out into the real area. Difficult place to survive. You're having, gonna have a hard time surviving, but the enemy is not gonna be able to come in force. For them, they're gonna have a hard time. So wasteland, a fortified city cave or an open field are the big brush answers. So that's that's 
they might have been there first and then the refugees or they might have been escorted back or then they might have made their way back. The refugees from Jerusalem came to me saying, the city has been taken. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me in the evening before the refugees came. So the Lord came and visited him and opened up his heart and mouth. And he opened my mouth at that time. They came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opening. I was no longer open and I was no longer speechless. He was able to speak and he was able to communicate the words of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, they who live in the wasteland, the waste places, the land of Israel, are saying, Abraham was only one, yet he possessed the land. So to us who are many, the land has been given as, as a possession. So because you know, they recuperated themselves from the waste, they had gone to the wasteland to survive. Wherever those places were, marshes, burning places, wasteland. They look, one man, Abraham, was given the land, he got the whole possession. We're alive. We've been granted that. Is that true? How do you maintain possession if God's given you a, a, something to maintain? You don't sin and you maintain it. You have to be God's people. Are you God's people because you're born God's people? Or because you surrender and serve Him? Surrender and serve Him. Good. Which is the same thing Romans was saying, right? Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with the blood in it, which was against the Lord's will. Then lift up your eyes to your idols as you shed blood. So this is all forms of idol worship or sin. Should you then possess the land? You relied on your sword, not God. You commit abominations. Each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? Are those God's people sinning? No, those are sinners. Thus you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As I live, surely those who are in the waste places will fall by the sword. Whoever is in the open field escapes the open field, I will give to the beast to be devoured. And those who are in the strongholds and the caves will die of pestilence. So there's your places of potential escape. And God's going to judge each of them. What happens if you stay to the Lachish or the mountains or the strongholds or caves? Pestilence. What happens if you escape to the field and try to survive in the field and hide? Beast. That's right. Beast of the field. Job team. And what if you escape to the wasteland? Sword. Sword. Yeah. Great. That and a thousand with the team. Um, I will make the land a desolation and a, war, and a waste. The pride of her power will cease. The mountains of Israel will be desolate so that no one will pass through. What happens if you pass through? You try to pass through the land and God's judged it. God walked me through from, walked me a route through on the way to, to Jerusalem and passing through from one place to another. Just pick up area, the country. Pick anything. Uh, a field. Okay, where would that be? Okay, so you have the Mediterranean, you come in off the coast, and then there's the fields. They grow all the wheat there, right? Before you get to the hinterland of the base of the mountains, and then you go up to that ridge of mountains, you know, where Jerusalem and all the high places are. You go down the other side of that ridge, and then you find what? Jordan. Good. Jordan River. You go up north, and what famous pass is there you have to get through? Could, we might see it in the future. Oh, oh no. Mm, Megiddo. Okay. 
So you can come in from the wastelands in the south. You can come in through, somebody mentioned a city earlier. Jericho. Okay. Okay, so you're in the field. You're in the mountains. All right, if you're in the field, you're walking through those fields via Del Mar or how, or some people call it the Kings or Queens highways. You've seen the videos with the world would fly, the flyover. What, what does that look like? How are you going to die, potentially? I mean, they've released all these animals from either bears from the north or lions from the south or, you know, tigers. I mean, you're going to be literally devoured by a wild animal. Like a giant lion is going to just, dens of lions are going to catch and maul you or trampled by something or bitten by something. You're literally going to get ripped apart, eaten or killed by a wild beast. Just roaming free. Why? Or how's that possible? Or why is that? Because God said. Because God said. And you, you hold up in a cave, you get up in there, you try to kind of survive from the beast. You're going to die from pestilence. You know what that is? Disease. Yeah. And then what else? Um, somehow you get to the wasteland, there's a couple of people, bandits trying to survive from the beast, they're going to kill you. You're going to die by the sword. From pirate, you know. So that's just complete wasteland. You're not getting in and out of, because God, God literally went from a thriving place of God's people conquered with a temple and all the people and tribes to not inhabitable. Did that happen? Why did that happen? That they they possessed the land, God said, right? Because they're Abraham's children, he promised. Who are God's people? People who actually follow God and serve God. That's, I think that's critical. It's obviously critical. Then they will know Say with me that I am the Lord. He is the Lord. God says he is the Lord. The Lord says I am the Lord. He says that. When I make the land a desolation and a waste because of all their abominations which they have committed. But as for you, son of man, your fellow citizens who talk about you by the walls and in the doorways and houses. So he's going to be known as a prophet. They're going to know he's a prophet. They're going to know the word of God's coming. So all these people knowing the word of God are going to gather. Are you getting excited? I got excited when I read this. They're going to know he's a prophet. They're going to come listen. I don't want to lead you along. They'll be talking about you. They're talking about you as a prophet. So here's a prophet who's literally laying down the word of God with the Holy Spirit, pouring his heart out for God, living for God, living for God, pouring his heart out. And you guys have been in the field serving God for over a decade, 12 years full on before that Christians, and you have been pouring your soul and your heart out for God, right? And if they turn and listen, they're below the trumpet, they'll live. They're talking about you, Ezekiel. They're talking about you, Ezekiel, by the walls and the doorways of the houses. Speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, Come now and hear what the message is which comes forth from the Lord. Hey, let's come and listen to what the message is from the Lord. They come to you as the people come and sit before you as my people and hear your words. Sounded pretty good, right? But they do not do them. They do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth and their heart goes after their own gain. Behold, you're gonna, you are to them like some sensual song of one as a beautiful voice who plays well in an instrument. For they hear your words and they do not practice them. So when it comes to pass, as it surely it will, 
then they will know that a prophet has been in their midst. So literally, you go into church, you listen to the sermon, you just sound like beautiful words. How many times have you heard, wow, that's beautiful. Oh, that's amazing. How many times have you heard this? Oh, wow, that's lovely. And that, and those people that continue to go in sin, they come, they know there's a man of God. They show up like a, to hear it, whatever motive they have. But they continue in their own gain and their own lust and their own sin. They just sound like melodious instruments for their entertainment and pleasure. And they continue to sin and not honor God. Or we pray that they what? We pray they hear the trumpet and turn to the Lord and live and pursue them. And our job is to sound that trumpet. Sound the trumpet, hear the trumpet, serve God. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Proceed. Welcome back to our praise and worship. We're here with Rachel Duncan, and it's Memorial Day as we remember all those who served and um, our family served. We just all those things that give us. The ability to defeat oppression and uh, worship God and serve the Lord, who's a living God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Go for Christ, Hebrews 4 12 Ministries. He takes the living, breathing Word of God and takes Scripture and put it to music. This is Psalm 102, 1 through 11. Do not hide 
and sacrifice for the Lord to be a Christian nation serving the Lord and so that we can revive it and give life. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Amen. This is Ezekiel 33, 7-9.
Jesus.